Uh, your first impressions off the top of your head of uh, having watched this film. And how long has it been since you saw the damn thing? Never? I personally haven't seen it in a long time, but I, I didn't realize it was a comedy. <laughs> right? Very funny. It's really high comedy. Uh, this is the first time seeing it since I think it came out in what, 80, 81? Yeah, yeah 81. 81. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, first time seeing it since then, horrified. <laughs> first of all, it's great to be here and see everybody again, and thank you for doing this evening. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's oh, a real thrill. Oh, thanks for coming. It seemed longer. <laughs> it is long. Slower. It is long. <laughs> Which might be the, a bit of the times of the movie, uh, of when that movie was long made, I don't know, but very long. And someone was mentioning that they did the twists at the end, that they were making that up. Uh, so uh, as they were doing the movie. Uh, I think Lisa can speak to that. So, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Lenore Zan. So, uh, great to be here. It's so nice to see all of my colleagues. It's been a long time. And uh, this was just my second movie that I had ever made. I just turned 20. Um, and I don't think I actually saw the movie, so this was the first time I've wow. seen it. Wow. <laughs> Holy moly. <laughs> um, you know, I was just saying that as a young actress here, growing up here in, in Canada, I'm really sad in a way that we didn't make a lot of other movies as well as the horror film genre. We did a lot of horror films in the 80s. Um, because mainly they were tax write-offs for yep. dentists and people like that. Um, <laughs> And while it was really good to get the experience and make the money and have and and uh, and learn your craft, um, it was. I got tired, and I'm sure my my friends would agree with having to take your clothes off and get murdered all the time. You know, like yeah. really, as a woman, it would have been nicer to have some some really more meaty meaty roles. And you were talking to me earlier about how your most interesting performance isn't even available anywhere. Yeah, exactly. Like you know, so so it's it's really interesting to see it, and uh, I think they did a really good job for the genre. But, you know, again, I, I, it makes me a little bit sad, too, that we, we didn't get a chance to really get our teeth into some sort of better roles. But, uh, but it's great to be here, and, and thanks again for having us. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. This is just so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is my set, uh, second Trash Palace experience. And all these films I used to uh, bury, like Deadly Eyes, Class of 1984, um, happy oh, birthday yeah. to me, because I I had started out working with you know uh, Claude Chabrol and John Huston and 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 but these are the films that everybody yeah. wants to see. These are yeah. the films that people have a riot with, and I I, I started embracing them when I saw um, uh, Deadly Eyes at Trash Palace, and I had such a great time. But it's true they were uh, originally Melissa Sue Anderson was the murderess. But then they they um, thought you know this is it's, it's too predictable and I used to hang out with Tracy Bregman and she said I don't know what's going on uh, apparently one of us is going to be uh, the murderers um, and it could be any one of us and and then and then it it, it was uh, Tracy and it reminded me of my favorite movie of course Straight Jacket you know the one where yeah, yeah. oh yeah yes and I don't know whether that was part of it but for me too um, people always said like. Um, you know, Jack um, just said to me, what were you doing out in the cemetery? Mm. And what I was doing initially is I was going to the party and I got the axe in the head. And you know, times have changed, but at the time, uh, with my getting the axe in the head, it was gonna be an X rating, which means they wouldn't make as much money. So they took that out. Only where the line gets drawn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah you, you know, you can cut a breast yeah. off. You can cut a breast off, yeah. but you can't put the axe in the head. Yeah, where my testicles is okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you got balls in the back room. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so you can see where it was cut now because I was coming for catatonic because oh. I just gone in and seen everyone, yes. and then I got the axe in the head. So they did, and you know, blood and you know, J. Lee Thompson was always carrying around a styrofoam cup, saying more blood, more blood. <laughs> so I had all that. And so they just cut it before any of that happened, where he was just kind of on it. He threw it. He would throw it. Oh yeah, he would throw the blood. He had, he had the, the yeah. He was holding the cup of blood. 
And then what happened to me is, um, you know, I, I really wasn't a natural blonde, a Kelsey Breeze. And um, so that blood that they put on me for the axe in the head, it, you know, uh, sat on there several hours, obviously, from shooting. And it turned my head uh, red, my hair, so I had to get it color corrected. Yeah. Anyway, your turn. <laughs> Where to begin? I don't even... I mean, it's it, it, yeah, that's right. It's remarkable. Um, uh, I was struck watching, watching it, and honestly, I do not recall if I saw it at the time or not. I just don't remember. But um, for one thing, doesn't Larry Dane look a lot like Matt Craven grown up? Yes. Like, we didn't know that at the time, but it, you knew? <laughs> Matt, Matt was head over heels in love with Lisa. Yeah. Oh, and, and uh, Mr. Dane sends his regrets, by the way. He's in Palm Springs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He did, that bastard never kept a promise. You know. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what. I don't know yeah. what. Happened. Uh, um, uh, yeah, no, but the, the, I just remember. I remember the thing with with Jay Lee and with, with with the blood because yes. the technicians were all over us with blood. There was lots of blood, and he made it seem as though they were being dainty somehow. Yeah. And I was like, this is astonishing. It was like buckets and buckets, and he couldn't get enough. We were like, oh, wow, I guess, you, I guess you need a lot. I guess you need a lot more blood. But that's, that's, that's a salient memory. But uh, uh, back, to the, back to the game. Well, I, I want to um, come back to uh, dinner where I was uh, listening to a different conversation, and then, and then you were like, oh, we were just talking about all the stuff that was going on on set. So I want to hear that, but first I want to get Charles up here mm. to kind of set the scene. No, I, I'm going to set the scene. Okay, with Charles. Charles got punched in the face by Glenn Ford. Oh, no. oh let's oh. let's get this going. Yeah, let, we want to hear Charles, this. come up here. <laughs> first, first AD, first AD. Let us raise in more ways than one. Can we get get this man a chair here? You can take mine. I'm I'm I'm. I'm it's it's right right. And, oh, and Rick, Richard saw it happen. I was right there. Were you there? Oh, yeah. Right before the lunch break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, we were talking about Jay Lee with the blood, and it was really quite comical because he would always leave set like that. He wouldn't change. He would go back to the Four Seasons Hotel dress covered in blood. Can you tell so the elevator story? Yeah, so he yeah. would yeah. love freaking people out in the Four Seasons lobby, right? Peel the shirt from downtown Montreal. But getting on the elevator and going to restaurants, covered in blood. And it's a very fancy, fancy uh, hotel, as you can imagine, the Four Seasons. But every day, the morning after, I say goodnight to him, you know, at the end of the wrap, it's the day, the next morning, I say, Julie, how did you go to the hotel? He says, oh, I had a great time with three little kids in the elevator. And the next day was two elderly women in the elevator that got off early, and the two kids got off early. He loves scaring people in the elevator, getting on the elevators at the Four Seasons, <laughs> covered head to toe in blood, just to freak people out in this funny old clothes that he wore. He was a real character. He was an extraordinary man to work for. And, uh, there were a lot of incredible ideas. We're talking about the, the, the switch at the end. I, Glenn was drunk, I don't know. He came out and he couldn't remember his lines, and we had to wrap for lunch, and Jay didn't want to do lunch, and Glenn didn't want to do lunch, and I called lunch, and Glenn got upset, so who knows. It's like, wow. such a small, Crazy. minor incident. It's amazing that anyone can remember it now. Yeah. In in Dunning, my best memory from the film, but I had a lot of great memories from the film. And um, watching all these, because all this cast was pretty young back then, and watching them work was pretty extraordinary with older actors, um, people like Glenn Ford, for instance. There's a lot of good bunch of all actors there. Mm -hmm. Earl Pennington, yeah. Yeah. I recognize Lester Brown. A lot of Walter Matthews. Walter, Walter, Walter Matthews. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Walter Matthews, especially who actually had his hair with a wig oh, right, yeah. he yeah, was actually yeah. bald. And as I found it out, Louis Del Grand does the searching. Louis Del Grand, right? Ron Lee was in the actually had a line. Murray Westgate. Murray Westgate, Murray Westgate was the ESO guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. The gatekeeper. He was the ESO guy for years. Yeah. On oh, right. Hockey night in Canada. That's right. He was the gatekeeper, yeah, at the mansion. And that mansion, that huge mansion you saw, was actually Hudson, Quebec, just up the Ottawa River. But all the rest was shot in Montreal except for the bridge sequence, the, the drawbridge, which we had to take a big second unit to Phoenix, New York, which is near uh, Rochester, New York, and it's on the Oswego Canal. So that drawbridge is actually on an American canal. So we did a big second unit down there, and then just cut it with Second unit directed by you? By me. By Charles Brandt. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's the camera shot in the front. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun, yeah. And the tank, now there's also Sharon Acker was in that movie. She's a great Canadian actress. Yeah. 
and is now retired, moved, married an American producer, moved back to Ontario, and lives in Dallas, up on Lake Muskoka now. A uh, lovely lady, and she had not worked in Canada for many years. And so that whole sequence you're describing was shot over three or four different locations. The bridge shot was in, the actual car falling off the bridge was in Phoenix, New York. The car sinking through the water was in a swimming pool, Olympic swimming pool in East End, Montreal, that we drained, painted to make it look like a river, and then filled again and put some underwater props in. So the car itself, when they're trapped in the front seat of the car with Sharon and most of Sue, was actually a tank, it was a prop car in a, in a studio tank with a drop, a water drop above it. So we could control the water flow into the car and raise the water level up so they're, they're drowning as the water rises up through them. But it was very complicated special effects. As you notice, there's a big special effects too. There's lots of special effects, not just the makeup effects, the blood, the gore, the guts, but there was also like lots of lightning, rain, wind, Atmospheric effects. It was a huge show for 1980, I, I think, back then. And it, was, uh, uh, it was actually a fairly reasonable budget, only like five or six million dollars, which went a long way back then. Um, so it was, it was quite extraordinary. Um, the other scene that was shot outside of Montreal was the motocross scene at the beginning, which was St. Benoit just south of Montreal, some motocross track. But most of the rest were shot at the McGill University. At Concordia, Loyola, the campus, the Crawford campus, with all of the dropping buildings of Loyola. And I can't remember all locations. Like the restaurants and that, I don't remember where we shot those. It was like a lot of locations. It was a road show, like every day we were going like a different location. Very Here, let me let me pass let me pass the mic to you. Before before I uh, do just to just one last glance off of the punch because I, I remembered reading about this in John Dunning's memoir. You're not dead until you're forgotten, and and he said, a, 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 yes, this just came out a couple a couple of years ago. Uh, Greg Dunning sent his regrets tonight. By the way, it's actually his birthday today. Of all things, John Dunning's son's birthday is the night of the screen, so he couldn't make it. Um, just he says the second AD was a good guy and said he wouldn't call the cops. So that was uh, okay. So sorry. Let me bring this one over for you, Rich. Okay, oh, oh, too late. Uh, the one location you're talking about was the Mapes. That's where they had the bar and the altercation, and that was shot in uh, on the West Island, of Montreal. Well, I'm, in, I'm from Montreal, and and I, I think most of you guys were from Toronto, right? And I think I was one of the local guys. Anyways, uh, long story short, I'm, I'm about four, maybe four films in. And uh, I've benefited from uh, a lot of the uh, these films that were uh, tax write-offs and stuff. And, and so, anyways, this was one of the larger films that I got to do. And so it was kind of weird because this was my backyard. So as we're going through scenes and there's people back then, everyone watching a movie, people would come out and watch. Lots of people would come out and watch. Half of them were my friends, and they were going, "What the hell are you doing there? You're supposed to be here with us. You know, get the hell out of there." So, anyways, but it was um, that place um, where we had the dance hall. It was called the Mapes, and it, and it was, I think it was built at the turn of the century. And there was a dance hall that everyone from the West Island would would go to and and, and dance. And then eventually became a great place to buy pot. Five <laughs> shakes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, there you go. Let's, let's, let's go to let's go to just. Uh, uh, reminiscences of the shoot. We should ask some questions too, if anybody's got any questions. But I was just watching it and remembered that I broke my arm during the shooting of that That's movie. Right, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. I just remembered now. Yeah. I um I was new to Montreal and um I wanted to learn how to roller skate. It was roller skating back then, and I went up to the mount and. Uh, I was learning how to roller skate with some friends, and I fell over and broke my arm, r broke my arm, my wrist. And I was terrified to tell the producers because you're not supposed to do anything that would might damage yourself while you're shooting a movie. So um, a friend of a friend was a doctor and took a look and said, "Yeah, yeah, it's, it's broken." So what they did was they put it in like a plastic cast that I could wrap on and wrap off. And in all the scenes, I'm not usually I'm not using my hands much. I had my thumb hooked in my like jeans pocket, and I wasn't using it at all because <laughs> it was broken. And it's funny because I had to, I did another movie right after this one in Montreal called Visiting Hours. I don't know if anybody's seen that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. With the really with the really long hair, and 
That one I had to get raped by Michael Ironside. And I had still the broken arm. Oh no. Yeah. And I remember I had to say to him, you know, just don't grab my arm, whatever you do, right? Because, um, I, yeah, I didn't tell him that the arm was broken again because I didn't want to, like, not get the part. So I did this big, huge scene with this broken arm, and it was very painful. But it's funny the things that you forget and then these little things that come back to you when you're watching it, you know. But anyway, that was just a little tidbit there. Um, any questions? Any questions? Yeah, let's open it up to questions yeah. now. Sure. There's somebody over here. Okay. Yeah. So. Oh, can we can we get you on the mic for the for the record for the public Let's record? Give you this mic. Absolutely. Get yeah, the mic. Yeah. Oop. <laughs> yeah, this may be awkward. I've got an aide. I can ask. I can ask questions on my aide. So anyway. Uh, so with uh, the hosp the current uh, the visiting hours film with Mike and Lyre inside, you just described a very dramatic scene with him. Um, it, what uh, after the traumatic scene? What was Michael Ironside like? Did he describe? Did he was he a gentleman? Was he um, was he just in character the whole film? How did the two of you uh, choreograph that scene, or any way, sort of? Um, well, obviously, I mean, we're here for, to talk for this movie. Happy birthday to me! But I'm going to tell you something. On my way over here, I was thinking about this uh, on the plane coming from Nova Scotia today because, you know, there's been all this stuff about physical and sexual abuse and, and harassment Thank and you. assault and, and the Me Too movement, which I am part of, and I'm proudly saying I'm a Me Too and a No More and a, you know, Rise Up and all that. But I was thinking about that. In the visiting hours scene, the... Um, yeah, it was this really intense rape scene, and uh, I was I was 20 years old, and it was my third film, and I remember that I had an agent by that time, and the, the, the agent had it in my contract that, you know, I would have panties on and a top, but I wouldn't show any, like, breasts. So, in this scene, Michael had a knife, and at one point in time, he started to rip open my shirt, my t-shirt, and the director and producer um, said to me, now listen, your agent said that we weren't going to have any nudity, but you know what, we have to have some nudity, because like, he's going to rip open your shirt, so like, you know, you know, we have to have some nudity, so it's okay with you, right? And I was like, no, it's not okay, thank you very much. And they're like, well, what are we supposed to do then? Uh, what are you supposed to do then? And, and you know, here I am, like 20 years old, and they're thinking they're going to get you to just go along with it. I said, well, why don't you pan up to my face and show what I'm feeling? Right? <laughs> right? right? Thank you. Right? But that's the kind of backward thinking. It's like it shouldn't just be about tits and ass and gore. I mean, yes, we know that people love that stuff, but... You know, it's like, what are the people feeling and what's going on? And I think that that's important in films. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and, and I'm really glad I stuck to my guns on that one because that is, in fact, what they ended up doing. And Michael was a gentleman, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Lisa, Lisa, do you want to pick up on that thing? What do you mean? The, the Me Too theme. I'm sorry? The Me Too theme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have... Uh, you know, it never stops, actually. Uh, I don't know where to start and where to end, because this even, you know, Pioneer Television in Toronto about a month ago. So, um, it just, it's just, you know, and, and it does have an a impact on your self-esteem as a person and as an actor. Um, you know, um, I remember being on uh, the ABC Talent Development Program where I got, uh, they went to six cities in North America, and I was chosen as one of their stars of tomorrow with uh, Arsenio Hall, and you know, there's, there was like six other people. So I went for my follow-up about a month after I'd been in Los Angeles auditioning. My manager went with me, and this is the, the two big twin towers in uh, Los Angeles to be the vice president again of ABC Casting, and um, he goes, you know what you need to do, Lisa? You need to wear dresses, don't wear any underwear, and sit with your legs open at the auditions. And I said, but, <laughs> I'm 922, but I, I'm, I'm a better actress than that. 
Like, I actually was sincere. <laughs> and so, so I, you know, I, I choked, right? And so I went outside, and my manager said, how did it go? And you, uh, you, you're, you're embarrassed, so you don't say anything. So flash forward several, several years, and this guy is now a manager, and, you know, he's got Rene Rousseau, and... Um, Charlie Theron, and he called me up and he said, you know, I'm really good with actresses, especially blonde actresses, and I'd like to manage you. And I said, John, why would I have you manage me when you're the guy who told me I should go into auditions and sit with my legs open and not wear underwear? He said, I never said that. But I got to tell you, like, people sometimes say, what happens to careers? And every time I went to network, network is like, it's your final step when you're about to do a series and you actually have to sign away your life the day, the night before, in case you get it, like, you know, you're doing six, eight years. And he'd be sitting right in the front row. And I'd go in and I'd start stuttering. I'd forget my lines. And these people have an impact. They're predators. And what's really unfortunate is there's a statute of limitations on it. And there isn't on murder, but I think there should be, because these people murder your souls. And that's why I think yeah. that there should not be. A, and, and actually, I, ha, I have um, a, you know, um, a, you know, a pet project that involves, it's a true story about this very famous Canadian writer, Sylvia Fraser, and about her abuse. And when I first st I started researching it, and there's a, an, an association in Canada, and apparently one in three children, and, but it's more boys than girls, but we're not hearing about it. And when, yeah. the other thing that gets to me is when people yeah. say, well, why did they wait 40 years? It takes you that long to grow up and have the courage, you know, to yeah. actually say something. Because especially if you're a guy. Yeah. You know, it's very, you know, you know look, at, look at the hockey player that jumped off the bridge. It's just so, so, you know, hard to say. So it really makes me angry when I hear these people saying, well, why did they wait so long to come forward? Well, first of all, they have the deeper pockets. They have so much money, these people that were your predators. And, um, you know, just over and over in your career, like, you know, when Terry Gilliam says to me, after dinner, so would you like to come up to my room? And you say, wow, so Uma Thurman gets the part. So had I gone up to his room or would it have made any difference? But I didn't really want to do that. So I, I remember my mother saying to me when I got into the business, she said, Lisa, I think the reason why a lot of, you know, actresses like Judy Garland and these people ended up getting a lot of, you know, having a lot of drug and alcohol problems is they, they did things and they didn't like themselves in the morning. And I just thought to myself, I... I have no, no control in my life over the success of my films, but I do have control over my integrity, and I want to like myself in the morning. Whoa. And man, it's been the right decision. Yeah. I just want to say, that, yeah, I want to ask Jack right now, like, I had an audition uh, for Meatballs. He was the casting director. <laughs> and yes, he was. And I had, I had, I had gotten my wisdom teeth out, so I had to put off going in. They said well, we can't put it off any longer, so I went out like I look like a chipmunk going in. <laughs> and we we met, and I I didn't get the part. Uh, Sarah Torga got it. But when I went home, like it was a big joke in my family that I'd gone out into this audition looking like a chipmunk, all black and blue. So they kept saying. You know, Vincent Price called and he said he has a part for you. <laughs> Lisa, did I say anything inappropriate in our audition? Because I don't remember. <laughs> I know, but I do. Yeah. <laughs> oh. You know, he, he was a total gentleman. No. <laughs> anyway, I wish I really wish I'd been in Meatballs. Or something. I, mean, I, I, I know, no, no, you were, but I, I really wish I would have been in that movie. That sounded like a really good time. He was a casting director. He was a casting director. No, 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 I think they were in those days they were called casting agents in those no, days. So somehow they started directing. Wow. Well, since you're here, I auditioned for Wheels. Is that a movie? And I didn't get it either. <laughs> Now the old like stores get settled. Nicholas Campbell. No, some American gentleman, but yeah. life moves on. Oh, oh I still love you. Story, just because oh. obviously you're talking about anything at all that comes to mind. <laughs> the, the guy who played Wheels, yeah. his name was Todd Hoffman, mm -hmm. and his life never recovered from meatballs. He because he thought he was going to be a big star, oh, and he yeah. he wasn't. And he, yeah. he, he just kept sort of blogging it, and he, you know, he was parking cars in L.A. and doing all kinds of stuff, and, and he kind of went mad. He yeah. actually went mad based on that. So see how lucky. That could have been you. <laughs> I, I, I had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, questions. Uh, I had a question uh, originally for Lisa, but then 
your story about being uh, meatballs. I you will just talk about any movie other than this one. Okay? If anybody mentions another movie, yeah. you will go for it. I am too stoned to have a long-term memory. So. I, I, un I understand. I but let me, let me just pause you and see if anyone has any questions about... about this, this, in the short term, uh, you were the last guy to ask a question, too, so we should probably yeah. pick someone up. We remember. Okay. <laughs> I just want to know what it's like to make a movie. Make a movie. This movie ah, in particular. Ah, yeah. Let's yeah. make a movie. Let's make a movie. I spoke in. I said, it looks like a comic. For, for what? As an actor? Yeah, sure. Making a movie? Yeah, well, um, getting to know these guys was great. Uh, like, I was I was a local coming in. These guys were all flown in and stuff. And not intimidating because they were, they were really good. Uh, I think we went to an Indian restaurant when we first met. You guys remember that? Wow. Uh, just off of Guy Street, uh, Guy and St. Catharines, I think. And they were really accommodating, really nice to chat with. I thought this was going to be fun, and in fact, that's exactly what it was. So it really comes down to the people you're working with. Mm -hmm. Some of us have worked on films with people that are, you know, not so fun to work with, and uh, and the crew. The crew on this film made it really, really easy to work. They were fun. Oh. They were easy to get along with, and I think that's large. Uh, that's due large in part to Charles. Yeah. He set the he set the tone for everybody. Everybody was relatively kind, short of a punch in the face, but, you know. Um, Charles took the punches. Yeah, no, he did. He, I think he set the tone for all of us. So if yeah. we've all been on film sets where um, it doesn't go the way that it's supposed to go, and people can lose their shit, and other people just get better. So. Just one of What's it like making a movie? As an actor, and a Canadian actor, the work is trying to get the work. Yeah. 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 When you get awesome. lucky enough to be in a film or a TV show or even a commercial, it, it's like being on a fucking holiday. Yeah. It is so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. You play house. You, you just try to make things. It's it, that is where that's why you become an actor because you get to do your craft. You get to try to make it right. So it, it was a ball. And people put your shoes on for you. You get treated royally. Yeah. You got to stay <laughs> humble. Canadian actors generally are very humble, mm. and uh, and they're also some, and and some of the best actors in the world. I'm talking about the stage actors and some of the film actors. Truly, some of the best actors in the world. I'm not talking necessarily because we're here, but some of the finest actors in the world happen to be Canadian. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, it's it's a ton of fun to be in a movie. I, very quickly, just I remember I auditioning for this. Uh, Jamie Thompson just interviewed. We didn't have to read. He just talked to us, and then I gave me the a, a part of the guy who gets the shish kebab. And then when I landed in Montreal, I said, "No, nah, I think you'll play Rudy." <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that was interesting. But it was uh, it's a lot of fun to get to. Mm -hmm, yeah. I was gonna say too. It was funny on set when um, the guy, everybody that got murdered when they were all dressed, they had the makeup on and everything, and we were at lunch. Nobody wanted to sit. With them. <laughs> they had to sit at a table by themselves because nobody wanted to look at them while they were eating. Do you remember that? Yeah, oh my I remember going for a walk. Yeah, yeah he went for a walk. Yeah, you tell that story. So, uh, Richard and I, I don't know, was it Etienne the it, yeah, as well? Etienne, I don't yeah. remember him being here. Yeah, anyway, um, we, we decided after lunch, on our lunch break, that we just, you know, wanted to take a stroll. Around the block and up to St. Catharines, I think, <laughs> and along. So you yeah. kind of went from the from the studio out and up a side street where a little boy was coming down on his bike yeah. and literally all fell off his bike. Here, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> all his makeup, and uh, and then we went up along St. Catharines, and cars were like stopping, and it was just like it was it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So so that's the thing about that shoot was that it more or less ended with like five days, right? Yeah. The yeah. birthday party was, was like, like five days, and you turned up real early. To put now, I was well, lucky. The whole, yeah, the whole shoot is in the, at night. Right, yeah. Yeah. right, right, right. A night shoot. Mm. But, but I was lucky. I had it in the stomach. It was easy. They put the stuff on. It was fine. Right. Matt, right, yeah. kebab, yeah. Oh, that yeah. took like five, three hours to put yeah. on, whatever. Yeah. And everybody, and you had a rough time. Yeah. And <laughs> But basically, it was day, and then you were there. Once that they went on, it did not come you off until the off. end of the day. You can't yeah. do anything. Can't and off. those were long days. Right. It, I remember it being super hot, super uncomfortable, the stinking yeah. of makeup of the whole yeah. thing. And mostly, we were sitting there dead. I mean, there was, there was nothing for anyone else. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, that was it. Like for hours and hours and hours. People are still. <laughs> yeah. And you're itching and all of that yeah. stuff. But you well, can remember how much you were making by the day. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and if you were doing any overtime, well, change to change. change. Well, yeah. there's a story about well, that. What Jack did not tell you, he was actually gruesomely murdered on camera. Uh, and my third AD, Robbie Ditchford, played your body double. You were disemboweled. Oh. Oh. And along with Lisa, your scene was cut of the axe. In the, we shot all this stuff. Oh, yeah. I was all there. We shot it all. And so we didn't use your, your cut because it was right. ruined the rating. And you were so violent, you're disemboweling. And I know nothing of it. You knew nothing of it. You were in there. You were, you were back in Toronto. And, we got, and my third AD, Robbie Ditchford, who's not a respected Montreal director, had it quite a strong physical resemblance to Jack back then. Mm -hmm. And he actually doubled Jack from just under the chin, right down to here, with a prosthetic gut and stomach and the ward that was holding. He trails, got yeah. gruelly disemboweled with his wow. guts all over the place. It was too much Where is for it? the sense. We need a director's cut. I have no idea what happened to that footage. Uh, Robbie would love to see it too, but you did die on screen in a gruesome manner. And it just never got made it to the end. Uh, you lost on the cutting of the floor. Any question? Any question back there? Uh, yeah, so I just, a few of you mentioned that you just haven't seen the film at all or you've only seen it when it first came out. Is that because you spend so much time filming you're like, you're kind of done when it's over? Mm. Is, it, is it weird to see yourself I don't think it was our done. proudest moment. No, I agree. And Nothing I, Lenore and I were, were looking at the stuff, you know, the cuts from other films before this came on, and, and we were saying, boy, we were really hard on ourselves because they're, yeah, I mean... You know, they're they're tax shelter terror films, but um, yeah, we don't watch them because we're embarrassed. Yeah. Oh, at the time, I mean, you know, you're only twenty or so years old, and you're doing a lot of these violent films. And to be honest, I don't watch horror films, but I did a million of them. <laughs> and so when people say, "Well, do you like horror films?" I'm like, I I, I like doing them. You know, it's fun to do it, and actually the blood and every stuff. I mean, it's chocolate syrup and red dye, basically. Kensington Gore. What's that? Kensington Gore. Kensington Gore. Gore. <laughs> yeah. It had a really nice thickness to it. That was Kensington Gore. Very expensive. But you know, but but um, but so yeah. So a lot of the films weren't exactly the kind of films that I really wanted to be doing. Uh, so they I didn't tend to watch yeah, them. they weren't uh, art house films. No, they weren't art house films, no. And that's why I said I just wish in a way that in the 80s when we were in our 20s that we could have done more of the art house films that maybe people might not watch but would be a much better chance for us to really get our chops as actors going. Um, I don't know. Like the Québécois films. Oh, yeah, oh. I know. Well, I mean, it's a sad thing, and Jack would be able to tell us a bit more about this, but how... Canadian um, Canadians like British English speaking Canadians don't tend to watch Canadian movies. Is it still three percent? These guys are great, but you know, like in general, the French watch their own movies yes. way more. Yes. Here, here's the difference: they're they're like the Australians. They make they, they the Quebecois. They make films about their own stories, and in English Canada. We're trying to make American stories, yeah. and you're only really good at telling your own story. Yeah. Really, yeah. I mean, I learned that by with working with Claude Chabrol. Uh, the first film I did with him was in English, and he was trying to make uh, you know an American detective story, and it like flopped. Yeah. Then the next film was called Violette Nausea, and it was like about the Lizzie Borden of France, and it ended up being a huge success. Really, really, that's you know the Australian films are if people would just tell their own story. Once you start imitating, that's it. And yet there are some good Canadian movies. I loved uh, uh, seeing uh, the one in, in Newfoundland and they're trying to get a doctor. Grand Seduction. Yeah. Grand Seduction. Yeah. Quirky, yeah. funny, yeah. amazing. They did come yeah. later. They came Did they see Maudie? Yeah, fabulous. Yeah. 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 Throwing down that's the their road. Own story. Going down yeah. the road. Yeah. Don Shavik. Yeah. 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 But again, some of those ones came later. Don yeah. Shavik's yeah. one was early. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're doing their own story. Yeah, they're doing their own story. We were trying yeah. to do, you know, uh, like the uh, Jamie Lee Curtis ripoffs. Yeah. Hit. Yeah, yeah, prom night. And you, you just have to tell your own story. 
Yeah, and that was structural too, right? That was what the way the uh, yeah, it was. that was the way the funding was set I mean, up to promote. You know, the, the difference is look at the the Canadian film industry. I mean, like we have legendary musicians and bands going way back, but they were you know Neil Young, Joni, they you know they are all, Leonard. They they tell their own story. They're not trying to imitate yeah, other musicians. Yeah. Yeah. I just going to mention, you know, it's a Cinepix film, and you know, Cinepix. If you read the book. Uh, John and Andre, I, I, I would like to do a few pictures of them. They financed all their own pictures, so they needed to make pictures that made money to make another picture, basically. Um, they did use CRTC money occasionally, but for the most part, they were just on their own. They took big risks that most other Canadian producers were not taking at the time, I'm telling you, um, trying to make commercial pictures that make a buck on them that a lot of other producers were just avoiding. So. Uh, with big credit, uh, they brought in directors like J.D. Thompson, um, like the other pictures I did for them. They brought in good directors, good good crew. You know, they spent their budget. They weren't lavish budgets, but they insisted on spending every day. They didn't want to save money. They said, let's make the movie, let's spend the money, let's do it, let's get the best we can. God bless John Dunning. And uh, he was a great, a great benefit for this, for this country. Did Byron do the food on Happy Birthday? He did, yeah. So, yeah, there was a friend of ours who catered the food. Yes, that, that he became a, a really close friend, but yeah. for those of you who've been in Toronto for a while and read Now Magazine when it first came out, yeah. Byron, who catered the food on that movie, was the first restaurant reviewer for Now Magazine for many, many years. Oh. Byron Iyanoglu, yes, uh, a food god, well-known, and, and uh, became a very, very good friend. But the food on that movie was great. Yeah. Right? Okay. <laughs> I would say it was great for him, but J.D. E. Thompson, who never once went to the catering tent really? or the craft, or never, never once ate with the crew, never once ate in public. He would eat by himself in his Winnebago. Crickets. Like and all he ate, insects. all he ate, all he ate was apples and cheddar cheese with oh. Dijon mustard. Wow. And he was kind of a reclusive man, and I spent a lot of time with him. In his Winnebago, was he was storyboarding and this and that, and, and well, the craft people cool. were very were very upset. Like after a while, Byron, particularly after about three weeks, got upset. He said the director never comes to eat. What's wrong? Does he not like our food? We make him anything he wants. He was quite upset. I said no. He just you know he's recovering from a lot of personal problems, and he just only eats a few things basically, <laughs> and that's the way it is. But he was an incredible incredible character that Danny Thompson. Yes. Uh, so, uh, two things. Number one, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. You guys are amazing, and thank you so much for coming here tonight. Thank you. I enjoyed your performance. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Thanks for watching it with us. It was really fun. It was fun. So, the question I have is, I heard rumors that Glenn Ford was a little testy on set. Is that true? How was your punch in the face? <laughs> like, did you guys, did but all of you, all of you get along with Glenn Ford? I didn't have anything to do with Glenn Ford. I, I we, 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 were, we were kept away from Glenn. Yeah. Don't, don't go near Glenn. <laughs> don't look at him, don't look at him, don't talk to him. I think he just did his scenes with Melissa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. He, was, wow. he lives in Montreal now, Melissa oh, Sue Anderson. Yeah. I, I tried to track her down with no, no uh, results. Great. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just add that Glenn Ford was a, a very unusual man, and you know he had a few problems, and one of his problems was he was very jealous. He had a younger wife, and he actually got really upset one day because he thought people were looking at his wife what? on one location, and he refused to come out of his trailer. It was a whole big kerfuffle. My, I couldn't believe my second day was kind of, he said, he won't come out, he's stuck, he's refusing to come out because people are... Someone whistled at his wife for this, that. It was an unbelievable wow. schmuzzle. Wow. There was a lot of alcohol involved, yeah. And so we had to yeah, go to the executive level for settlement to get the come to set. But when he was on set, he delivered. Glenn Ford, you got to remember, he was one of the greatest stars in Hollywood. Yeah. Before he, yeah. he shut down. He single-handedly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, so if it they did they got points for him and, and if it wasn't and, 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 and Melissa also had Canadian papers, didn't she? Oh Tracy Tracy. Oh. Tracy. But had Melissa Canadian Sue papers. Anderson, I found it fascinating that uh, one time on the set, Frank Sinatra Jr. was her was her, right. her boyfriend. Yes. And he was coming on set. Frank Frank Sinatra Jr. Yeah. But still, 
So, oh, it's kind of a so cool. Oh, you have a oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I became quite good friends with uh, with Sue, and she had a chaperone. Do you remember his name? He was, yeah, that was her manager. Right. Then she told me yeah. she was having an affair yeah. with him. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> 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 Yeah, he was much older, and it was it came much later that she revealed. Clearly, she no. likes older men. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Unbeknownst to me, but anyways, oh, we like we that. were um, um, uh, my girlfriend at the time, stuff like that. We were in uh, Melissa Sue's uh, um, apartment that they had on the Maisonneuve, I think. I can't remember the name of the hotel, but anyways, we were all there, and uh, we're we're all doing something, and uh, Sue was in the washroom. And she goes, she yells out, just. Some pick up the phone. So I pick up the phone, I go, hi. And he goes, who's this? And I'm going, well, it's, it's Sue's apartment. She's asked me to pick up the phone. And says, well, this is Frank Sinatra Jr. <laughs> and I, please talk to Sue, and said, well, she's just in Washington. She's coming out. There's just a bunch of us about to go out to dinner or whatever it was that we're doing. He says, I'll wait. <laughs> so I sit there just stare at the phone, and that's exactly how that went. So, uh, well, I got to go on about Melissa Sue Anderson because I, I, I became well, well acquainted with her in another life. Because some years later, she turned up back in town. Why? She was married to a guy named Michael Sloan. Now, Michael Sloan, ah. well, who, who knows who Michael Sloan was? He he was uh, L.A. sort of third, fourth generation. Hollywood aristocracy yeah. who became a B-level TV producer, mm -hmm. came up to Canada, produced the Alfred Hitchcock Presents series yeah. that was done here My in the 80s, side. and then moved on to Kung Fu, The Legend Continues. Ah. And I was around that gang. We wrote some of those. I acted in some of those. And he would have these dinners, and we would go out for dinner with Michael, and who was, and because she and I had worked together, he really liked having me around because I could be friendly with her, someone that she knew. And she, she got kooky, I'm telling you. She, she was really a little bit just sort of... I thought she was like that then. Well, it, it, the volume turned up, sort of, oh. after, yeah, after, like we were afterwards. <laughs> like, so, I just felt there was this kind of really, real uh, iciness. Let's be nice. Yeah. No, no, Let's she's always nice. nice, but I was just really glad that I guess you had the scenes with <laughs> <laughs> She seemed icy. I didn't have any scenes with her. Yeah, I don't. I guess I did too. I don't remember those. She didn't talk to the rest of us. I mean, we never. She never talked to us. She was on a soap opera. She was in yeah. her own dressing room. Like she was just in her dressing room in her Winnebago or whatever. Like I never. I don't even think she, I, she might have said hello once, but that was about it. But Tracy was very friendly. Yeah, she was. Tracy Bregman was very friendly. Um, but I, like Melissa Sue Anderson, she just wanted to keep to herself. And I think that was her method acting. I don't know what it was, but I didn't get to know her at all. But I thought she actually did a good job in yeah. this. Yes, I did. And to be honest, watching it, I said to myself, um, I bet this was a really good choice for her because she wanted to get away from that sweet, sickly, little blind girl in um, little, little, little House on the Prairies, right? And she went blind once in it too, right? Yeah. So. You know, she had that sweet little part, and so I'm sure she just wanted to kind of break from that. Which this, I don't even know what happened to her career after this. Do you know Charles? I have no idea. No, you know, yeah, I, I don't know. After, after this movie, movie, though, did she break me still? Yeah. 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 Right. She's on chopping now. Yeah. But I mean, what happened to Melissa Sue after this? Do you know Jack? What happened to her career after this? Well, when I knew her, she was alone. Okay. Oh wow. All right, well, I guess maybe it didn't work, but I was thinking that this would be a good way to sh her to show a different side of yeah. her. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I don't know. I, I don't really know what happened to her. Sure. Mm. Oh, I see, right. How about you guys? Any, yeah. one more, any, any more, more questions? Let's do one more from the back, please. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just because I didn't mention, so many plot twists. Did you all have a coherent idea of the story while you were shooting it? No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 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 Really, no. How do you no. act when you don't know who you are or what you're doing? Well, I didn't really have, for me, I didn't really have to have a coherent. <laughs> I could get up and leave after the credits stop. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I just heard that they didn't know who the killer was, how you know, when they were shooting. I would come in and my head would be on a platter and then I'd go. 
Then I'd come back and I'd be dead, you know, around the table, and it was like, oh, it's tra oh, Tracy, Tracy, Tracy's the killer. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> you know. So did, did they cast? Was the were those casts at the end? Did they? Did you have yeah, to yeah, cast they're, for that? They're all molded. Yeah, my well, my head my head was a mold. Yeah. Uh, but I was in the dark part of the scene where the in the, where the platters. It was actually me under yeah. sitting under the table with my head the coming first through. Shot was, oh, wow. it was me in the dark yeah, yeah. before they he pulls the eye out. Oh, and I do remember uh, Jay Lee throwing blood at me constantly and it dripping down the whole inch down my shirt. Um, but that head that you pull the eye out of is a cast. And apparently, I heard that Greg Dunning. Used to bring it out at Halloween and put it on his dining room table. <laughs> so he had my head. I don't know where he was at. And I was like, where's my damn head? <laughs> I would love to have had that. Oh so, God. yeah. You've had, you've had two heads made, right? No, I, my, uh, the, the head in the toilet. No, that was my own head in that oh. toilet. Yeah, I laid back in a toilet. Uh, make sure toilet, and they didn't have to cast my head. They cast my body, though. I forgot that was your head in, in yeah. the toilet. In yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but they did do a cast of my body? I don't even remember why. I don't know. I think they were going to have my body hanging in the shower or something. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. So. We're, we're at 1230. Are we feeling it? Post Halloween party. Yes. Yeah. 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 We've tried the patience of these good people. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be merciful. Thank you so much.